and he ended up drawing the Maverick comic book for a long time and quite a few of those, those things. He used to go to the set of the Maverick TV show and just stare at James Garner because he had to draw him from every conceivable angle. So he had to keep memorizing his face and he did it without photo reference. He just remembered what he looked like when Omen drew the comic. Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to A Word on Westerns, where today we're talking about cowboys and comics. And here's a, a piece of original art from a Lone Ranger. When I first saw these in the early 70s, I was amazed at how large they were and how finely detailed the draftsmanship was. I remember going to a friend's house, uh, Jim Ivey, who was a, a comic dealer, original art dealer, with Charlie Roberts and Neil Austins, and we, we founded something called the Orlando Con in Orlando, Florida, to honor these great artists. But we went into to Jim Ivey's house, and he's smoking a cigar, and He's pulling out all these different pieces of art like this and just like throwing them on the ground. Here's a Hal Foster, Prince Valiant. Here's a, X, a Secret Agent X-9 by Alex Raymond and cigar ashes are going all over it. And then his little dog comes running around on top of him and then starts scooting across the top of him. And Jim picks it up and goes, well, a little cigar mark on that one. It's okay though. I mean, it's like, okay. but great stuff. Because of that, we started the Orlando Con about the same time that the San Diego Comic Con was uh, initiated back in, in the uh, the early 70s. And somebody who's been a part of that, Mark Evanier, a dear friend is here. And Mark, if you could come up and, and tell us a little bit about the original art. Uh, I should tell you a little bit more about Mark. He, he writes produces, directs the Garfield animated series that's been going on for how many years? Uh, 18 years. 18 years. But he also uh, began his career in comics and was mentored by the great Jack King Kirby. How did that come about? In 1969, Jack came to the um, uh, science fiction convention that they had locally here, and he met the officers of a comic book club I had. I, I was the president of the Los Angeles Comic Book Club, the largest comic book club in the world, we claim, because we didn't know of any other comic book club that was larger. We used to meet at uh, Palms Park up near the San Diego and Santa Monica freeway intersections. I wasn't at this convention. Our officers invited Jack to come speak at the convention at the club. Uh, he didn't, Jeff never came to the club to speak. There was only one professional who ever came to the club to speak we invited, and that was Sergio, which is how I met him. But Jack invited us down to his house. He was living down in Irvine at the time, and I met him, and six months later, I was his assistant. And doing what as an assistant? Darn near nothing. Uh, he, he, didn't, he, they, he was a man who, who wrote and drew and didn't need assistance. He just wanted somebody around to keep him company, and every so often, you know, do the dirty work of fixing up a piece of artwork or, you know, here, you know, trace that over or cut that out or paste that up, stuff like that. It was very trivial, but I just got to know the man, and he was one of the few authentic geniuses ever in the comic book field, in any field I've ever, ever encountered. Amazing man. And he, his artwork was so dynamic and had this great action and flow to it. Was he fast? He was very fast. He was, he was the lifetime, in his lifetime, he produced more pages of comics than anyone else, which would have been impressive if they were mediocre, but every one of them was wonderful. He was just an amazingly talented artist uh, who's been stolen from incessantly over the years, people copying his work. And uh, he set out a whole style. He basically invented the idea of adventure comics and, and superhero comics and, and kept revolutionizing the business. You know, if you, if you go to Comic-Con and you say a bad word about him, 25 people will beat the crap out of you. <laughs> and I'll be one of them. Uh, but after I worked for Jack for a little while, I went to work for the company called Western Publishing Company, which was responsible for most of the great Western comics. By it wasn't named after the genre; it was named after a geographic 
and, situation. And these were sold under the Dell yeah. comic. Well, what, what it was, this is, this is, this is tricky. Uh, the people who wrote and drew this comic book did not work for Dell Comics. They worked for Western Publishing. Western Publishing created the insides of all these comic books and then sold the right to print them to Dell. Dell put their name on the, on the cover and Dell handled the, the printing and the distribution, but the editorial content was all done by Western Publishing. And same with the Disney comic books, same with the Warner Brothers comic books, all the Bugs Bunny comic books, all the Daffy Duck, all the Donald Duck, all the Hanna-Barbera comics, they were all done by Western Publishing. And Western was the only comic book company, really, the only, one of the majors, that had an office in Los Angeles. Originally, their office was downtown, and then for most of the 50s, it was on Little Santa Monica, Beverly Hills, right next to what used to be the Friars Club, if you know where that was. And out of that office, they edited most of these comic books. Uh, in 1962, Western and Dell got a divorce, and no longer were the comics Western produced printed of the Dell insignia. Dell hired their own outfit to do them in New York, and Western published the rest of the comic books they did by themselves under the gold key imprint. So it was kind of like one the Western publishing was one company the whole this whole period of time, but it was their college said Dell on the cover until 62 and Gold Key after that, which confuses the hell out of everybody. Dell and then later Gold Key, it was the premier place for the TV Western adaptations. And so everything uh, that you saw on TV pretty much had its own comic book. There was The Lawman, the Maverick, Dan Spiegel, a, a great artist, drew Maverick, and they took the scripts from the Maverick series and adapted those. They did the same thing with quite a few of the comics. I know Sugarfoot, Brannigan's Boots, the first episode of the Sugarfoot comics, I think Dan drew that too, yeah, yeah. Uh, was adapted from the very first episode of Sugarfoot. And it's uh, just a terrific story. It's like storyboards, only just uh, really a, a fine, fine artist. I think Dan was the greatest Western comic artist who ever lived. Dan Spiegel got out of the, the army in 1949, and he had sort of in the newspaper, wanted someone to draw a newspaper comic strip. He'd never drawn a comic strip, but he applied for this. And Dan was a very serious artist, serious illustrator. And the turn, he went to the address for the ad. It turned out that they were looking for someone to draw the Bozo the Clown newspaper strip. And Dan said, well, I can't do that kind of stuff. I don't do funny stuff. I do serious. And he started to leave. And the guy who was hiring the Bozo uh, <laughs> artist. And he was dressed up as Bozo like, yeah, the tongue. Yeah. Red ball in his nose. <laughs> he said, well, you know, my brother works for Hopalong Cassidy. And... They've been thinking of doing a newspaper strip over there. Why don't you go over and talk to them? So Dan took his portfolio, drove over to the Hopalong Cassidy offices, walked in. Mr. Boyd happened to be there at the moment. Dan showed his work, and he had some drawings of horses. And uh, Mr. Mr. Boyd, Mr. Cassidy said, hey, I like the way you draw horses. Let's do a newspaper strip. So he drew the Hopalong Cassidy newspaper strip for 10 years. And while he was doing it, he was so fast, he had time to do other work. And Western Publishing, being in Los Angeles, saw the strip and said, hey, would you like to draw some comics for us? And he ended up drawing the Maverick comic book for a long time and quite a few of those. He used to go to the set of the Maverick TV show and just stare at James Garner because he had to draw him from every conceivable angle. So he had to keep memorizing his face and he did it without photo reference. He just remembered what he looked like when Omen drew the comic book. And they look great, and they read terrific, too. Horses are are very, very difficult. But also to tell a, a flowing story in just a short uh, span of pages is, is very difficult, too. But again, it's like storyboards. Sometimes the artists that were chosen couldn't even get the faces right. You'd look at some, and you'd go, well, I know I got the picture of uh, John Russell on the cover for Lawman, but there's somebody inside, and I don't know who that is. There was, uh, of course, a comic about uh, Tales of Wells Fargo, which uh, starred Dale Robertson. Dean doubled up year after year after year and did great stunts on that series. But when it first started, the artist gave Dale Robertson twin guns, a double rig holster, which he didn't use. After uh, several issues were published, somebody figured out 
that not only did he just have one gun, but that he had a left-handed rig, and that's the way the comic evolved. And so you'll see that evolution in the comic, too, which is, is pretty terrific, and it did look like Dale, yeah. too. Yeah. One of the problems the artist had doing these comics was the likenesses, because frequently the, art, the, the, the actor had approval, and the actor would have to take the artwork to the set, or the editor would take the artwork to the set, and the actor would say, I don't look like that, and they'd have to redraw them all and make them handsomer and make them... And, and there were actually artists who would say, um, oh, I don't like being shot from the left side. I, as my, my right side of my face is good. And the artist is like, no, no, this is a drawing. It doesn't, doesn't work like that. I can, I can draw the left side of your face fine, and fix anything that's wrong with it. And, and the other problem that they had was that if you were drawing a superhero comic or a detective comic, the hero is running around all the time. So he's in all sorts of different poses. And then if you're drawing a Western comic, you get this script and the guy's on his horse for half the story. Not a lot of different poses you can draw, man. This, they're, you know, one drawing of a guy on top of a horse looks very similar to another drawing. So you have to break the page up and find ways to make it more interesting. And this was the challenge these artists faced. Uh, and they did some amazing work. This Lone Ranger strip, by the way, this was drawn by a man named Tom Gill, who, uh, well, this uh, one actually is, uh, Charles Flanders wrote it and Tom Gill was the artist on it. Uh, well, Tom Gill also drew the comic stories, too. Right, yes. Which were uh, almost the whole run of the Lone Ranger comic book yeah. were drawn by Tom Gill. Actually, the secret of Tom Gill was that he was an instructor at the Society for Illustrators, uh, the, 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 school, the School for Visual Arts, it was called. It was the only school, art school at the time, teaching comic book art, and he would get his students to uh, do homework by helping him with his assignments. So, uh, so he got uh, the, an awful lot of good artists passed through that strip under the name of Tom Gill. One of my favorite artists uh, uh, was so popular that he ended up hiring people working under uh, his name, Alberto Gialetti. And he did Sergeant Preston of the Yukon, which was another adaptation of a radio show into a comic book. Later, of course, it was a TV series as well. But when it first was a comic, they had the painted covers. And then when it was the television series, Richard Simmons was on the cover in his Melgy outfit. But the artwork by Alberto, to me, he was the Rivington of narrative art. He could do horses. He could do scenes. He made it look authentic. And he did gun smoke. He did have gun will travel and a lot of other ones. But he, Gialetti, gave the, the, the artwork some tension, some dynamics. And his brushwork was terrific. And he later, he did a Star Trek. So he's known as the Star Trek artist, even though, for me, his specialty and his superior work was in the, the Western comic books. He actually drew the Star Trek comic book for a few issues before he ever saw the TV show. So I can make the third or fourth issue. He actually drew the Enterprise landing on a planet. And all the Star Trek fans got started screaming and trying to boycott the comic. <laughs> So tell us about the the, the Comic Con. I, I went uh, first, I guess, in 1977 when it was still at a hotel and it was a small group. And Mark was there, and he he seemed to have been doing every panel discussion. It still seems like that way, but mostly about the the Golden Age art. He does a quick draw that's a very funny, sold out room filled with people event that Sergio is a part of and Scott Shaw and and it's just hysterical but I can remember being at one of these early ones and so Mark says well what are you doing for dinner tonight Rob and I go nothing because I'm down there alone I, I drove down there and he says well we're having dinner with uh, Will Eisner and, and Jack Kirby you want to come <laughs> yeah <laughs> So that's how casual it used to be. You, you could hang out with these artists and talk to them. It was the same way when we were doing the Orlando Con. We would have Harvey Kurtzman and Jack Davis and Hal Foster, Roy Cray, and all these legends come to our convention, which was pretty small. I mean, we, if we had 500 people, we were in heaven. And Hal Foster would always give us a couple of pages of Prince Valiant, which was his strip to auction off so that we could break even and not lose money. And so we would auction those pages off for $200. And now they're probably $15,000, those same pages. Yeah. 
Well, the, the Comic Con in San Diego, I went to, I've been to every single one of them. First one was in 1970. We had 300 people there. We thought that was a huge number. Today, there's 300 people ahead of you in line to buy a Diet Snapple. <laughs> Uh, the convention will have about 130,000 to 150,000 people this year over its four and a half days. And if you've ever been to the con, it's amazing. You cannot possibly see all of it. It just goes on for days and days. There's dozens and dozens of panel discussions and events and lectures and presentations going on. I will be emceeing 13 of them over the uh, Thursday through, through Sunday period. Uh, some about... The, history of comic books, some of them about, I also, I bring in, since I, I direct cartoon voices also, I bring down cartoon voice actors and we, we demonstrate their craft. And then I do, a, we do this thing called Quick Draw, which Rob mentioned, where we get three very fast cartoonists, one of them Sergio up in front of the audience. We, we fill up this, the room seats 3,000 people and we always turn like at least 1,000 away. And I give challenges to the cartoonists that they don't know in advance. But Sergeant Rock and Benny Blue are dating and they're right now I I don't know how to draw either. Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you So how that baby look like? What would their baby look like? Sergeant Rock. <laughs> it's very funny and very fast. If you, get, if you do get to the convention, that's on Saturday morning. Mark, thank you for being here. Okay. It's a wealth of knowledge. Now I'd like to introduce the fastest draw in comics, Sergio Aragones. We all know Sergio's work from Mad Magazine, which he's been doing for how many years? 50 some years. No. I started in 1962. And I have missed only one issue. And it was not my fault. <laughs> it was the French post office. So, you grew up uh, in, in Mexico. Your father was in the film business, or, and you watched a lot of Westerns growing up? Totally. In, in Mexico, we adore Westerns. It is fascinating that every second word in a Western is a Spanish word. You know? So in, in Mexico, it's a great, great love for, for Westerns. And as a kid, I was raised <laughs> in the 40s. So all the Westerns were the old type of Westerns. Since I was a kid, I was fascinated. And my father made a couple of American Westerns. Uh, one of them was called The Monster of Hollow Mountain with Guy Madison. And he was shot in Mexico. And he was the, what's called the line producer of the Mexican part because it was a co-production. Your father was? Yes. While they were shooting it, they suppose they have these big monsters attacking these cowboys. And <laughs> they had a big stick with a little tennis ball was supposed to be the head <laughs> and it was kind of distracting so I went to the back and I drew a dinosaur head you know like the monster because I've seen it it was about this big but I knew how it, so I, I drew a, a head and then they come ah, and they paste it up and they oh this really helps a lot because <laughs> there it was the big monster you know so I was part of the movie too well, something that Sergio did that we'd like to talk about is that not only were comic books filled with uh, the known characters, the TV characters, uh, are the movie adaptations of which there were many, including The Searchers and uh, The Last Train from Gun Hill and Cheyenne Autumn. All these great Westerns were adapted into comic books, but they needed new heroes too. And so there would be the Ringo Kid, Apache Kid, Two Gun Kid, Kid Kid, Billy the Kid, <laughs> but there was also Bat Lash, and Sergio created that. How did that come about? Well, uh, I was living in New York and uh, or visiting. I don't recall, but the uh, the editor was called Joe Orlando, who also uh, edited a lot of the monster comics, and they wanted a a different western, so they came to me. And they asked, Sergio, we want you to create a different cowboy. So I created a different cowboy. You, you see that your house and, and start thinking something that he hasn't been done. What made him different? He was, I didn't want him to be a clown, but I wanted him to be humorous because that's what I do better, <laughs> it's humor. So I wanted 
the situations to good humorous. And he was polite and he loved, he loved good food and uh, good music. He was a very different couple. And uh, so, so there was a lot of uh, yourself put into this character. It was me. No. <laughs> <laughs> It was it was it was different, but he was a cowboy. He was a real a real cowboy, and uh, the uh, what I did is uh, I wrote I plotted the stories. I had planned all his life because I I figured out the day he was born and what what events were happening, like by 1910 the Mexican Revolution, etc. So I had all these places where he he was going to participate. But coming from Mexico and not speaking English the way I should by now, um, I need... How many years have you been here? Since 1962. <laughs> but uh, there was a, a, a great writer called Danny O'Neill. And so what I do is when I'm writing, it's easy for me to draw than to put words. So I draw the stories. I draw them uh, in 8 by 10s. And the dialogue is very basic because it's very difficult for a foreigner to to speak cowboy, you know. That word, like I reckon, <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to put it on. <laughs> so Daniel Neal did an incredible good work making that cowboy talk, which is so special and so so wonderful. And he did a, a great work with it. So it, we work, and in those times, comics had a certain type of audience. Television was being so strong with Westerns that it was very difficult to maintain a comic book story because everybody was watching television comics. So they they stopped the 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 story. The, it was a lot of fun when it lasted. You know, I think I have a piece of original art from Batlash right here. One of the great Western artists too, John Severin. It was my favorite. Yeah. Oh, he, he, he blew horses like nobody else. Uh, you, you know, what's interesting, too, is hold this for just a moment. The size of a modern comic compared to the size of the old ones. Now, this is a Jack Kirby from Boys Ranch, but it's a lot larger. And look at the number of panels here, too, and, and the detail. Yeah. <laughs> The detail that you get, so uh, you know, but the artwork is is still beautiful in this. And I've got something here that's really interesting. This is uh, original art from a Gene Autry Big Little book. Now, these Big Little books were sold for a dime each, and each of these little panels would be on one side of the page, and on the other side of the page would be narrative. It would be copy. It would be you'd learn to read by buying. A big little book for 10 cents and and this is the actual art from a gene autry big little book you have here a, a print of one of the best westerns artists ever mm -hmm. jean giraud yes. and he does a, a a comic strip he did he passed away for many years in france called lieutenant blueberry and it was probably one of the best ever drawn and that was Western. a serious adult Western. In fact, Correct. you know, what we've got right now is this was adapted with Mobius, which was his other name, into a, uh, a movie. It was in development hell for 10 years. And the, and the actor who was set to play this, picked by them, is sitting right here, Martin Cove. Marty, could you come up here and tell us about Lieutenant Blueberry? <laughs> Sergio, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 